Hello students, welcome to this another discussion video on the topic investment in associate. At the end of this lesson, you should be able to discuss the concept of intercorporate investment, determine the circumstances when investor can exercise significant influence over the investee, and account for investment in, uh, investment in associate using equity method. First, let us discuss now what a corporate share investment is. When we say intercorporate share investment, uh, this is the purchase of equity, in, uh, equity shares now of one entity by another entity. So in short, one entity is investing in another entity by acquiring share capital no, of that entity or shares no, of that entity. Usually, the purpose of investment is to accrue income no, in the form of capital appreciation and dividends. So, kung um, ang isang investor ay bibili ng shares ng isang company or corporation, most probably, ang nasa isip niyan ay mag-increase yung value ng kanyang pera no? through the capital appreciation. So, it, the investor is hoping na uh, sana no, tumaas yung presyo ng share ng company kung saan siya nag-invest. And at the same manner, um, the investor is also hoping to, to, to receive dividends no? para dagdag income on the part of the investor. However, uh, it is possible, class, na hindi lang yan ang reason kung bakit um, nag invest ang isang entity sa another entity or corporation. An entity may purchase na enough shares of another entity in order to exert what we call significant influence over the financial and operating policies of the investee. So, hindi lang pala ang reason why a company might invest into another company is to earn. No, it is also possible that there are other reasons why the entity is purchasing shares no, of another entity. So, one of which is ito. No? Baka meron siyang ibang plan. And this entity wants to exercise um, significant influence over the investee, no? yung company kung saan siya nag-invest um, ng shares. Now, let us discuss ano bang ibig sabihin ng significant influence. So, pag sinabi natin significant influence class, no, it is the power to participate no, in the financial and operating policy decisions of the investee. But take note, wala tayong control over those policies. So, pag merong significant influence, what you can do is just participate no? like in the policy making. Um, meron tayong participation. So, at least meron kang say, no? meron kang voice in terms of formulating uh, financial and operating policies of the investee. So, kailan ba um, magkakaroon ng significant influence ang investor over the investee? So, if the investor holds directly or indirectly through subsidiaries, 20% or more of the voting power of the investee, it is presumed that the investor has significant influence unless it can be clearly demonstrated that this is not the case. So, ibig sabihin pala, class, no, we are assuming that if the ownership no, of an investor will reach 20% or more, but of course, not more than 50%. Kasi pag more than 50% na, it means na hindi na lang siya significant influence, but rather control na. So, dito, if your ownership or if the ownership of the investor is 20% or more, um, of the voting power. So, ibig sabihin, um, dapat ang investment ng investor doon ka investi ay shares that has voting rights. 
And in that case, we are referring to the ordinary shares. So, magkakaroon ka lang ng significant influence if you own 20% or more of the ordinary shares of the investee. So, we are again presuming that if you have enough uh, investment no, um, in an investee, then you can exercise significant influence. Unless, um, merong naka-indicate na wala ka talagang significant influence. However, a substantial or majority ownership by another investor does not necessarily prelude an investor from having significant influence. So, ano ibig sabihin nito? Ibig sabihin lang, yung ownership na 20% or more, presumption lang natin yun na kapag ganun kalaki ang ownership ng investor sa investee, ay magkakaroon na siya ng significant influence. Pero there are also cases class wherein um, hindi naman umabot ng 20% or more ang um, investment ni investor ka investee, pero nakaka-exercise pa rin siya ng significant influence. Now, so in that case, um, we can still say no na merong significant influence. So in short, hindi lang pala talaga uh, pagbabasehan yung ownership. Kung hindi, kung ano yung actual na pangyayari no, or ano yung actual na relationship ng uh, investor sa invest. So at what extent no, can an investor participate in the affairs of the uh, investee? So take note that beyond the mere 20% threshold of ownership, Past 28 provides that existence of significant influence is usually evidenced by the following factors. So, ito yung sinasabi natin na um, it, there are cases wherein hindi naman umbabot doon sa 20% na threshold ang ownership ng investor ka investee. Pero um, we can still say that this investor has significant influence over the investee. So, kailan yun mangyayari? No? Ito na yung mga circumstances Kung kailan, um, masasabi natin na ang investor still has significant influence over the investee even if the ownership um, na investor sa mga shares ng investee ay hindi aabot ng 20%. So first is, um, we, will, we can say that there is significant influence ang investor ka investee if meron siyang representation in the board of directors. So of course, if this investor has a seat no, uh, or would sit as one of the board of directors of the investee, meaning they can really participate in the policy making of that investee. So in that sense, no, we can say that they can exercise significant influence. Another is the participation in policy making process. So again, di ba, kasi sabi natin, Merong significant influence kapag nakakapag-participate tayo sa pag-formulate ng financial at operating ng mga policies of the entity. So, of course, no, if you are able to participate in that policy-making process, then you can say that that investor can exercise significant influence over the investee. Another is if there is material transactions between investor and the investee or if there is an interchange no, of managerial personnel. So in short, um, posible na naghihiraman ng managerial personnel ang investor at ang investee. So in that sense, we can say that indeed there is significant influence. Another is the provision of essential technical information. So ibig sabihin nun, kung uh, nag-share na no, or nag-provide na si investor or si, in si investor or si investee ng um, mga technical information para makatulong no, sa operations ng um, investor or investee, then we can say that their relationship is or this investor has significant influence over the investee. So these are the instances or circumstances na masasabi natin na kahit pala um, hindi aabot ng 20% na threshold ng ownership ng investor sa investee ay consider pa rin natin siya na uh, makaka-exercise ng significant influence.
Okay. Now, we were saying that um, for an investor no, to exercise significant influence, we are presuming that if the ownership of the investor is 20% or more, so nag-a-assume tayo na meron na siyang um, significant influence. Now, what will happen if as of now, no, um, at, as of the present, hindi pa aabot ng 20% yung ownership ng uh, investor ka investee. However, there is the presence of this what we call mga potential voting rights. So pag sinabi natin pot pa, potential voting rights, this refer to share warrants or mga debt or equity instruments that are convertible into ordinary shares. So that is when tawo sa kanya mga potential na na voting right. Kasi once in exercise na investor ang share warrants for example, magi increase di ba ang number of shares na hawak niya. So it will it can also increase the uh, percentage ownership or the percentage interest no of the investor ka investi. Or kung meron siyang bonds na hawak tapos convertible yun into ordinary shares or shares na hawak niya pero convertible or preference shares na hawak niya tapos convertible siya into ordinary shares. So if that's the case then the investor is holding no mga potential voting rights. Ang issue dito class is that ano ba ang treatment no? Um do we consider also voting potential rights in our um in, in determining no in our determination kung meron bang significant influence or wala ang isang investor sa investee so ito yung provision ng past 28 so sabi ng past 28 when there is potential voting rights no it shall be considered in assessing whether an entity has significant influence for as long as they are currently exercisable or convertible. So, yung requirement ng past 28 is that pwede natin makonsider. No? Like, for example, uh, as of now, meron ka lang 15% na interest sa investee. Pero you have existing voting rights that potentially can increase your interest from 15%, baka maging 25% kung in-exercise mo yun. Na ang sinasabi lang ng standard ay Pwede nating makonsider ang potential voting rights if this potential voting rights are already exercisable or are currently exercisable or convertible. So meaning at, at any moment no um upon the uh, decision of the investor posibleng i-exercise na nga or i-convert na nga itong mga potential voting rights na to and would increase no the um, percentage owned by the investor ka investi. So that is why we can assume that yun na nga, no, pag more than or 20% or more yung interest na hawak no, or yung ownership ni investor ka investi, we are presuming that the investor can now um, significantly influence no, the investee. Now, what if there is a loss of significant influence? So, kailan ba yan ma mangyayari? No? So, kung kanina, um, possibly na from walang significant influence, magkaroon ng significant influence. Ito naman, what if meron ng significant influence, pero over time, kasi for example, binenta niya, no? binenta yung uh, shares niya, then it is possible that the number of shares no, owned by the investor will now decline or will now decrease. So, kailan ba itong mag-loss or there is a loss of significant influence? So, this happens when an entity loses its power to participate in the financial and operating policy decisions of the investee. So, the loss of significant influence can occur with or without change in the absolute or relative ownership interest. It also occur as a result of um, contractual agreement. no, So, depende yan. So, um, again, class, hindi lang natin pagbabasehan kung ang um, percentage, no, um, ang ownership or ang percentage ng ownership ng investor kay investi, kundi mas binibigyan natin ng um, halaga or weight, no, yung actual talaga na um, sitwasyon 
ng relationship ng investor sa investee. So if the investor can really participate in the um, financial and operating policy decisions of the investee, then we can say that um, that investor has significant influence over that investee. And that also can anytime no be taken away from the investor. So depende doon sa, um, for example, agreement ng investor tsaka investee no, or mga circumstances na posibleng nangyari. Isa na nga doon is possible na wala na siyang significant influence is because baka hindi na siya or hindi na enough yung shares niya no, para makapag-exercise siya ng significant influence. Now, ano bang bearing no? kung merong significant influence ang investor over the investee? So, ito class, no, um, meron siyang bearing sa pag-account ng ating investment in um, shares. Why? Because um, if the investor can significantly influence no, the investee, so meaning nakakapag-participate siya in the um, operating and financial policy decisions of the investee, so, ibig sabihin nun, itong investor tsaka investee are considered as a single economic unit. So, parang uh, sa paningin no, ng accounting, pag ganito yung uh, um, relationship, no, ang economic relationship between the investor and the investee, then ang gagawin ng accounting is i-consider niya ang investor tsaka investee as a single economic unit. And of course, that treatment would affect kung paano natin i-account ang ating investment in that particular share. So again, um, pag merong significant influence ang investor over the investee, ang mas appropriate na method of accounting for your investment in equity security is etong equity method. So again, equity method is applicable kapag uh, merong significant influence ang investor kay investee. And in this method, we are considering that the investor and the investee are considered no, as a single economic unit. Kaya affected yung pag-account natin. Now, what are the accounting procedures no, pertaining to equity method? So, ito yung mga accounting procedures na no, related to equity method. So, una, um, etong equity method na to, this is only applicable for investment in ordinary shares. So, di ba remember, ordinary shares lang yung may voting rights, no, yung may voting power. So that, um, ito lang yung uh, shares no, or type of shares na makakapag-exercise ka ng significant influence. And that is why equity method will only be applicable to this type of shares, no? the ordinary shares. The account title used no, in this particular method is what we call investment in associate. And this investment in associate is classified as a non-current asset. Now, initially, Itong in, uh, investment in associate na yan ay measure natin at cost. Na, so, kung na-remember nyo yung ating discussion sa previous na lesson, so, ganun din yung ating um, pagka-recognize no, at initial recognition. Uh, we just measure it at cost. Now, uh, meron na lang different sa treatment kasi diba, uh, dati yung napag-usapan napag natin is about cost method. So, this time, equity method. Sa ano bang kaibahan? Dito sa equity method class, since considered as one single economic unit or single economic unit, ang investor at investee. So, pag mag-report ng profit ang investee, magre-recognize sa investor ngayon ng share niya sa profit ng investee. So, what will happen is that in the records of the investor, mag increase ang kanyang investment in associate account. No? So, 
the carrying amount of the investment in associate of the investor is increased no by its share in the profit of the investee on the other hand pag loss naman yung ni-report ng investee affected din yung investment in associate account natin bakit kasi uh, the investor also has to recognize the its share no in the loss of the investee so in short kapag merong loss ang carrying amount ng ating investment in associate account ay magde-decrease siya. So that is for the share in the profit and in the loss. Now, in terms naman sa dividends, kapag ang investee ay nag-declare ng dividends, di ba class doon sa previous natin na topic or lesson, di ba pag merong nag-declare ng cash dividends, we recognize it as dividend income. Kasi nga doon, we are accounting the investment under cost method. But dito sa equity method class, take note that kapag merong dividends na declare ang ating investee, ang dividends na yan na na-receive ng investor ay i-consider natin as a reduction to the carrying amount of the investment. O diba? Iba yung treatment. No? Kasi diba sa cost method, Pag meron tayong dividends, we have to recognize dividend income. But dito sa equity method, pag binigyan ka ng dividends sa investee, ibig sabihin nun, sinasauli na niya portion of your investment. So you'll treat that as a reduction no, to the carrying amount of your investment. So ito yung mga items na unique no, sa treatment under uh, equity investment or equity method. So, I have here an illustration na just to um, present kung paano ba uh, gagawin or paano ba na-apply yung concepts na sinabi kanina in a problem solving. So, we have here, on January 1, 2019, an investor purchased 20,000 shares of the 100,000 outstanding shares or outstanding ordinary shares of another entity at 200 per share. So, the investment represents 20% of equity interest and the investor has a significant influence over the investee. So, ito, yun, ito na yung keyword natin no, na a investor ay merong significant influence over the investee para masabi natin na pwede natin gamitin ang equity method sa uh, investment in shares na ito. So, the acquisition cost is equal to the carrying amount of the net um, assets acquired. So, walang difference. So, yung amount na binayat mo ay equivalent lang sa carrying amount ng assets or net assets na acquire mo. So, if you are to record that um, acquisition, so ito yung entry natin. No? Magde-debit tayo ng investment in associate at 4 million. That's at cost. So, that's 20,000 shares times 200 per share. So, that's 4 million. And credit tayo ng cash. Okay, ito yung ating T-account. No? So, yung investment in associate account natin, meron tayong balance na 4 million as of January 1, 2019. Now, during the year, so in 2019, the investor reported a net income of 5 million. So, sabi natin kanina, pag nag-report si investee ng profit, so since considered as one or a single economic unit sa investor at sa investee, ang gagawin ngayon ni investor ay magre-recognize siya ng share niya sa profit ni investee. So, ito yung competitions. No? Kung ang total profit ni investee ay 5 million, tapos sa investor ay merong 20% ownership kay uh, investee. So, this is how we compute the share in the net income. So, that's 5 million times 20%. So, that's 1 million. So, yung entry natin, take note class, no? Nagde-debit tayo ng investment in associate. So, we are actually increasing our investment in associate account, no? By 1 million. Equivalent to our share in the net income kay investee. Tapos, credit tayo ng investment income, which is, of course, a profit and loss na account, no? Which will be presented in your 2019 income statement. So, that's 1 million. So, ito na yung ating, um, ito na yung ating um, T-account. No? Sorry, parang nag-blot, no? nadoble yung ating figure. But 
This is 4 million plus 1 million. Um, that's debiting your invested in associate account here. So yung balance natin as of this time is 5 million. Okay. So next is we have this. Um, uh, ito na yung, ano, yung, yung saktong journal entry or I mean T account na na posting. So we debit. 1 million here so that meron tayong 5 million na balance. Now, what if during 2019 or December 2019, nakareceive tayo na, or nakareceive si investor ng 25% share, no? Uh, share dividend from the investee. So, balikan lang natin, di ba? Meron tayong original na 20,000 shares. Tapos, madadagdagan niya ng 25%. That's 20,000 times 25%. So, dadagdagan tayo ng uh, 5,000. So, yung 5,000 ordinary shares na receive natin, um, mga share, uh, dagaling sa share dividend, makakadagdag doon sa original shares natin na 20,000 shares. So, yung atong to, uh, ang ating total shares now ay 25,000. So, we are holding now a total of 25,000 shares. So, balikan lang natin. So, ibig sabihin, uh, pagkatapos ng share dividend, itong 5 million na to, imbis na 20,000 shares lang ang mag uh, de divide no? ang ng 5 million, after the share dividend, magiging 25,000 na sila. So, that's 5 million divide 25,000 shares. Now, if you're trying to figure out the cost per share. So, again, pag share dividend, what we have to do is just to prepare a memorandum entry. Kasi, di ba, ang effect lang naman ng share dividend ay um, mag increase ang ating shares, mag increase ang ating number of shares, Especially this one na uh, um, similar or the same lang of those held ang um, dineclare na dividends. Tapos yung total cost or yung cost per share natin ay uh, magre-reduce or magde-decrease with no effect in the total amount of your investment na sa ordinary share. So yung total cost na investment ay hindi siya affected. So let's have another entry here or another transactions affecting the um, investment in shares. So we have here a share no, in the loss of the investee. So after 2019, ba 2019, meron tayo na report na income or profit. Now by 2020, what if nalugi si investee? Nag-report siya ng loss amounting to 1 million no, for 2020. So in the same manner, nung ginawa natin sa profit, so, magkocompute din tayo ng portion na dapat nating i-recognize dito sa loss ni investee. So, that is why we have here the total 1 million na net loss. Multiply lang natin by the percentage ownership na 20%. So, you'll have 200,000. So, debit tayo ng loss on investment which is again in an item to be presented under your profit or loss statement. And then, kikredit tayo ng investment in associate. So, with that, ito na yung magiging itsura ng ating T-account sa investment in associate. So, di ba, yung 2019, meron tayong 5 million na balance. With this entry here, nag-credit tayo ng investment in associate na 200,000. Ang matitira na lang sa ating investment in associate account ay 4.8 million na lang. Now, pagdating ng uh, December 31, 2020, meron tayong natanggap na cash dividend. So, ang sabi dito, the investee declared and paid a cash dividend of 2,500,000 on ordinary shares on December 31, 2020. So, ang binigay sa atin is yung total cash dividend na i- uh, na i-declare or i-declare uh, ng board of directors ni investee. So with that, um, since alam natin na ang ating percentage no, na ownership ay 20%, para makuha natin yung amount na matatanggap ni investor, we simply multiply our ownership interest na 20% by the total 
cash dividends to be paid by the corporation or the investee. So, that's a total of 500,000. So, observe class that kapag meron tayo na-receive na dividends, ang gagawin natin ay, of course, no, magde-debit tayo ng cash, 500,000, but take note of your credit. No? Ang credit natin ay investment in associate. So, ibig sabihin pala, pag meron tayo na-receive na cash dividend and your accounting, no, your equity investment under the equity method, um, ang effect pala ng cash dividends natin ay nakaka-decrease ng ating investment account. So, this is now the T account of your investment in associate. So, dito tayo nung... Um, last natin na transaction. So, this time, pinost natin itong ating uh, cash dividends na natanggap. So, 500,000. So, your balance sa investment in associate ay 4.3 million. Okay. So, um, again, balikan lang natin no, na under the equity method pala, um, ang investor ay mag-recognize ng share niya sa profit or loss ng uh, investee. And also, the cash dividends is treated as a reduction to the investment account. So, yun yung mga dapat nating um, isa, isip, no? E remember, related to equity method of accounting your investment. Now, proceed tayo dito, no? Um, Dagdagan natin ng iba pang concept kasi yung concept na pronunciation kanina related to equity method ay basic concept no like uh, pag nagdeclare or pag merong uh, pag merong profit or loss ang ang in, ang investee dapat mag recognize din si investor ng share niya sa profit or loss tsaka pag merong cash dividends na declare si investee i consider na reduction sa investment account ni investor. Now, more than that, meron pa ibang mga accounting uh, concerns to pertaining to equity method. So, this is one of them. Itong excess of cost, cost over carrying a month. So, this class no or this accounting problem will arise when the investor pays more or less no, than the carrying amount of the underlying asset. So, ibig sabihin, uh, in our previous na illustration kasi, yung binayad ng investor, pag-acquire niya sa shares ng investee ay just equal sa carrying amount na binili, na binili niya. So, in short, um, nagbayad siya, for example, ng 4 million, ang carrying amount ng binayaran niya is also 4 million. So, wala tayong problema. The acquisition cost is just equivalent to the carrying amount of the, ne the net assets purchased by the investor. Now, meron tayo magiging problema kapag hindi equal yung acquisition cost, in short, yung binayaran, and the carrying amount of your net assets na in-acquire. So, for example, no, sobra yung binayad ng investor para lang makabili ng net assets or ng shares ni investee. So, ano bang treatment natin dyan no, sa excess of cost over carrying amount? So, ang sabi dito, if the investor pays more than the carrying amount of the net assets acquired, then the difference is commonly known as the excess of cost over carrying amount. And itong excess na to, it may be attributable to the following. First, check muna natin. No? Baka meron mga undervalued na asset si investee. So, anong ibig sabihin? Baka yung percent na um, net assets ni um, investee ay baka hindi, hindi yun proper, properly valued. So, baka meron mga assets doon na um, undervalued. No? So, meaning presented sila at an amount lower than what is really the actual na fair market value nila. So, if that's the case, then um, yung excess ng cost is pwede natin i-charge no, na attributable doon sa undervalued na mga assets ng investee. 
Now, kung wala tayong makitang undervalued na asset ni Investi, wala na tayong ibang um wala na tayong ibang uh, mapupuntahan or wala na tayong ibang account no na pwedeng um i-charge or i-attribute yung sobrang amount na to kundi sa goodwill. So bakit, 'di ba? Um why is it that this particular uh, investor is willing to pay more than what he will be receiving from uh, the entity? So for example, yung nagbayad siya ng 5 billion pero yung net asset naman na binayaran niya ay 4 million lang. So bakit ba willing siya mo buy or willing siya magbayad ng sobra-sobrang amount? So bakit willing siya bumayad ng 5 million sa supposedly 4 million lang man sana na value ng net assets ng entity. So meaning maybe no there is something in the uh, in the investee na gustong gusto ni investor. And hindi natin ma-pinpoint kung bakit nga ba uh, willing siya magbayad no for that much um sobrang amount Sobrang uh, payment, no? sobrang yung binayad niya compared sa makukuha niya. Maybe the investor has seen or has or has has been seeing something na hindi na na-account or hindi pa na-account ni uh, investor or ni investee. And that is why we are crediting it, we are, we are attributing it to goodwill. Okay? So goodwill is of course an intangible asset and it is unidentifiable. No na intangible asset. Ang term na nga natin diyan ay the most intangible of all intangibles, no? Kasi nga hindi natin siya mak uh, makikita. Tapos um di mo alam, di ba? Um if somebody is already uh, viewing you such or ang presumption or ang perception ng tao sa iyo ay okay pala na hindi mo alam. So bakit sila willing na magbayad ng mas malaki compared sa kung magkano lang yung value ng net assets mo. So maybe there's something in you or in the investee na willing bayaran ni investor. And again, we are attributing that to goodwill. Now, ano yung treatment natin sa excess of cost over carrying amount? So if the investee's assets are fairly valued, then the excess is attributable to goodwill. So yung sinasabi natin no na um lahat na naman ng identifiable assets ng uh investee ay tama naman yung market value. So kung wala ka na talagang ibang mapagbalingan no or ma, ma pagwala na kailaing mapasanginlan kung mga nung mas mas taku man ang gibayaran sa investor compared sa ihang na dawat, then we will attribute that excess to goodwill. So take note lang class that if the excess of cost over carrying amount is attributable to goodwill, goodwill is not amortized. No, hindi yan ina-amortized. But uh, it will be tested only for impairment. Check lang muna natin kung hindi ba impaired, no? Or hindi ba impaired yung goodwill. Now, if the attributable or if the excess, no? is attributable to the undervaluation of take note depreciable asset. Say for example, building, equipment, no yung mga assets na nagde-depreciate. Then ang treatment natin ay ang excess na yon shall be amortized over the remaining life of the depreciable asset. So, ano ibig sabihin nito? We have to be conscious no kung uh, saan ba natin chenorch, ano ba yung ating um ano bang reason kung bakit mas malaki yung binayad ng uh, investor compared sa kanyang uh, binili. No? So if it is because of the, the undervaluation of a depreciable asset, then take note that there is still, or this has um, an effect. No? Meron pa itong uh, accounting consequence pagdating ng um, year-end or yung gagawa ka na ng report. Kasi kapag depreciable asset, yung dahilan ng excess of cost over carrying amount, then we have to amortize that over the remaining life of the depreciable asset. So later we will um, understand this more because merong tayong uh, illustration no, para mas ma-relate natin itong mga concepts na uh, dinidiscuss ngayon. Another is, what if the uh, cost 
over a carrying amount or the excess of cost over the carrying amount is attributable to undervaluation of land. So, di ba, take note, land is not depreciable. So, since land is not depreciable, we will not amortize the excess. So, hindi natin siya i-amortize. However, kapag nabenta mo yung land, lahat ng amount, yung excess of cost over carrying, over carrying amount, um, attributable to the undervaluation of land, will be expensed lahat. No? So, again, that is kapag ang land ay na benta na siya. No? So, hindi, wala na siya sa possession mo. So, na-realize na siya. So, that's why you have to expense no, the amount, the excess of cost over the carry amount attributable to the undervaluation of land. Lastly, if the excess of cost over the carry amount is attributable to undervaluation of inventory. So, ano yung nature ng inventory? Hindi rin siya depreciable. No? But, um, Hindi tayo mag-amortize also for the inventory pero pag it's the same lang sa land kapag nabenta mo na siya if you're able to sell it uh, during the year for example then um the amount katong excess of cost over the carrying amount will also be expensed na kapag nabenta na ang inventory Okay so meron tayo dito um problem So, this is the sample or problem, no? illustration related to the excess of cost over the carrying amount. No? Kung paano natin siya i-account. So, at the beginning of the current year, an investor purchased 20% of the outstanding ordinary shares of an investee for 5 million. So, the net assets of the investee and the date of acquisition are fairly valued except for a depreciable asset for which... The fair value is 2 million greater than its carrying amount. So, meron tayong undervalued no, na depreciable asset. Any remaining excess is attributable to goodwill. The carrying amount of the investee's net assets was 20 million. So, kulang ito. Dapat 20 million. Pakicorrect na lang. No? Dapat this is 20 million. So, ito yung total na net assets ng uh, invest. Investee, 20 million. So, this should be 20 million. Okay? Now, paano natin i-account to? No? So, unang-una, check muna natin kung magkano ba yung excess. Say, for example, here, the acquisition cost is 5 million. So, ito, ba? This is your acquisition cost, 5 million. Magkano ba yung value na binili na net assets sa investor? So, sabi dito, di ba, the net assets or the carrying amount of the net assets of the investee was 20 million. So, to get the carrying amount no, na dabili ni investor, so we simply multiply uh, yung 20 million by the percentage no, na ownership na investor. So, that's 20% 20, uh, 20 times 20 million, that's 4 million. So, ibig sabihin yung Carrying amount na inacquire ng investor ay only 4 million. Pero nagbayad siya ng 5 million. So, sobra yung binayad niya. So, saan natin i-attribute um, i no? yung ating 1 million na excess of cost over carrying amount? Based on the problem, sabi niya, um, merong undervalued the depreciable asset. So, we have here, the excess is attributable to the following. First, um, undervaluation of depreciable asset with the remaining life of 5 years. So, that's 20% times 2 million. So, that's 400,000. So, we are only getting no, the portion na applicable sa investor. So, since ang 2 million is applicable sa tibuok na uh, company, ang kay investor is 20% lang man iyang ownership. So, mula na itong gikuha. 20% of 2 million. So, that's 400,000. And again, as mentioned by the problem, any remaining excess is attributable na to goodwill. So, ang sobra na 600,000, um, 
i-attribute na nato na siya sa goodwill. Okay. Now, what is the bearing of this? No? Kasi, di ba, we have accounted the excess of cost over the carrying amount. So, we have determined that it's 1 million, that 400,000 of which is applicable or attributable to undervalued na depreciable asset and yung 600,000 ay sa goodwill. Now, meron pa siyang effect sa accounting natin. So, let's check muna. No? Ano ba yung entry na ating gagawin upon acquisition? So, pag-acquire natin sa ating, um, or I mean, pag-record natin sa ating acquisition, ito lang yung entry natin, class. Debit lang tayo ng investment in associate at 5 million. So, if you have noticed, this is just the amount, di ba, na binayaran natin. And then, credit tayo ng cash na 5 million. So, kung pansin ninyo, dito sa ating um, initial na pag-record ng ating uh, investment in associate, hindi natin ni-reflect yung mga undervaluation ng depreciable asset saka ng goodwill. So wala no we only we only know that uh, there is an excess of cost over carrying amount in the amount of 1 million which is attributable to the undervalued depreciable asset and goodwill. But we do not reflect it yet in our record. No? So do na lang yan makikita sa ating notes to financial statements. Now, the excess again is attributable no, to the following. So again, um, balikan ko lang, uh, 400,000 for the undervalued or undervaluation of depreciable asset. Tapos ang remaining life niya ay 5 years. Tapos yung remainder ay sa goodwill na, no, na 600,000 for a total of 1 million. Now, after or at the end of the accounting period class, sa so sabi natin, itong, an, uh, itong uh, excess of cost over carrying amount na attributable sa depreciable asset, ay amortize natin yan at the end of the accounting period. So ito yung entry dito. No? So what will happen? Itong 400,000 na to na attributable sa depreciable asset ay i-amortize natin sa kanyang remitting life na 5 years. So that's 400,000 divided 5 years. So it will give you 80,000. So ibig sabihin, for the next 5 years, every end of the reporting period, meron ka isang entering ganito. Magde-debit ka ng investment income, magde-credit ka ng investment in associate. So this entry is actually related to your amortization ng excess of cost over carrying amount which is attributable to depreciable asset. So ito yung magiging uh, itsura ng iyong investment account, no? So yung 5 million natin marereduce siya by 80,000 because of our amortization. So ang balance na lang ng investment in associate account natin at the end of this accounting period, will be 4920000 Okay. So, we have another illustration. Now, before Tama proceeds sa sunod na topic, we have another illustration. So, in April 1, 2019, August Company purchased 20% of the outstanding shares of an investee for $7 million. So on this date, the investee's net asset totaled 30 million and August company attributed the excess cost of the investment over the carrying amount to an identifiable intangible asset which was undervalued and had a remaining useful life of 10 years. So the investor reported net income of 1.8 million for the current year and paid a cash dividend of 600,000. So dito, nag-compute muna tayo kung magkano ba yung excess of cost over the carrying amount of the net assets. So you have here, acquisition cost is 7 million. We compare it with the carrying amount of net assets acquired. That's 20% the uh, ownership interest no, of the investor ka investee multiplied by 30 million the total net assets of the investee. 
So, we have 6 million. So, sobra yung binayaran natin kay investi by 1 million. And ang sabi sa problem, yung 1 million na yun ay attributable daw to an identifiable intangible asset which has a remaining useful life of 10 years. So, yung, yung information na to, importante to because it will tell us na itong identifiable asset na to, this is amortized or this is the kung sa PPE pa na siya, uh, depreciable. Pero ka-intangible asset man meaning it is subject to amortization. Okay? So, this will be your end. Uh, this will be your journal entries. So, first, no, para sa April 1, uh, we record the acquisition of our investment in Associate. So, we debit 7 million and we credit cash. Pagdating na December 31, of course, um, since equity method money, mag-recognize tawag share na to sa um, net income ni investee. So that's 20% of uh, 1.8 million. So we debit investment in associate at 360,000 and credit investment income at 360,000. Another transaction is yung nag um, declare no or nagbigay ng dividends si investi. So debit tayo ng cash, credit tayo ng investment in associate for 120,000. That's uh 20% of your 600,000. Lastly, meron pa tayong isang entry sa December 31, yung amortization ng excess of cost over the carrying amount. So, di ba yung excess natin amounted to 1 million? So, yung 1 million na yun, i-divide natin siya by 10 years. So, every year, for the next 10 years, mag amortize ka talaga na amounting to 100,000. And, Ano yung entry natin dyan? So, the debit tayo ng investment income, credit tayo ng investment in associate. So, this will be your um, the account no, for your investment in associate. So, di ba una, meron tayong um, acquisition na 7 million. Tapos, meron tayong share sa net income na 360. Tapos, uh, naka-receive tayo ng dividends na 120. So, na-reduce ang ating investment in associate account. Uh, another thing is yung nag-amortize tayo ng excessive cost over carrying amount na reduce din ng ating investment in associate account. So overall, ang ato ang ending balance for the investment in associate account will be 7,140,000. Now for the investment income account, ito na yung magiging itsura niya. So una di ba, we have recognized our share in the profit amounting to 360,000. So ito. The next one is, nung pag-amortize natin sa ating uh, excessive cost over carrying amount, amounting to 100,000. So with that, no, 360,000 minus 100,000, you'll have 260,000 is your investment income to be reported for the year 2019. So you know, that's our excess of cost over carrying amount. Now, let's proceed naman doon sa baliktad. No? Uh, this time, excess naman of net fair value over cost. So, in short, sobra yung net fair value ng associate na binigay sa atin. Tapos, konti lang or no, mas gamay ra ito ang gibayad. So, excess of our past 28 provides that any excess of the net fair value of the associate's identifiable assets and liabilities over the cost of the investment is included as income. So, more taog na kaginan siya, no? Because you are paying less for more, no? You are paying less amount for um, a greater value, no? Nang net assets ng um, associate na nabili mo. So, again, no, ang sabi dito, pag ganun daw, pag ang um, net fair value ng assets ng associate na binili mo ay mas sobra or mas malaki compared sa cost na binayaran mo, then yung sobra, yung excess, shall be 
included or shall be reported as income in the determination of the shareholder share or uh, the 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 investor share of the associate's profit or loss in the period in which the investment is acquired. So let's have a sample problem, no? Para ma-imagine natin. So we have here an illustration beginning at the beginning of the current year, an investor purchased forty percent of the ordinary shares outstanding of an investee for fifteen million. When the net assets of the investee amounted to thirty million, so the at, at the acquisition date, the varying amounts of the identifiable assets and liabilities of the investee were equal to their fair value, except for the following. So first, there is an equipment whose fair value was seven million, greater than the carrying amount. Um, and the remaining useful life, no, na wrong, kulang ng letter A. The remaining useful life of this equipment is four years. Another is yung inventory, no, na ang fair value niya ay 2.5 million greater than its carrying amount. And this inventory was all sold during the current year. So meron pa tayong additional information. The investor reported a net income of 2 million for the current year. And paid 5 million cash dividends at year end. So we have here uh, the computation. No? First, let's determine magkano ba yung excess of net fair value over cost. So let's start with the acquisition cost of 15 million. So can pair lang dito yung acquisition cost, saka yung carrying, carrying amount no, ng net assets na acquire natin, which is. 40% of the 30 million. So that's 12 million. So kung titignan natin, meron pa sana tayo excess of cost over carry amount amounting to 3 million. Kaso lang meron mga undervalued do na mga asset ang investee. So una, uh, yung excess attributable to equipment, which is 40% of your 7 million, that's 2.8 million. Tapos yung excess attributable to inventory, which is 40% of your 2.5 million. That's 1 million. So it will turn out that um, sobra na yung net fair value ng assets na nabili mo compared sa cost na pinayaran mo or yung acquisition cost mo. So we have here the entries. Una, pag-recognize natin sa acquisition, so, debit tayo ng investment and associate. Take note of our entry, di ba? Nang debit lang tayo ng uh, about na binayaran natin, which is for uh, 15 million. And then, credit tayo ng cash. So, after that, um, recognize tayo ng share natin sa net income, di ba? Ito naman yung mga usual transactions sa equity method. So, yung share natin sa net income, that's 40% of 20 million. That's 8 million. Tapos, uh, credit tayo ng investment income. Uh, another is yung share natin sa cash dividend, which is 5 million. 40% uh, of 5 million, you have 2 million. So, debit tayo ng cash, credit tayo ng investment in associate. So, after those, no, uh, mga share sa net income, tsaka share sa cash dividend, so dito natin babalikan yung mga excess of cost over the carrying amount. So, first yung attributable to equipment. Di ba ang sabi yung equipment ay uh, depreciable pa for 4 years, no? Ang useful life niya ay for uh, 4 years. So we have here amortization of the excess of attributable to equipment. So that's 2.8 million divided 4 years. So this is our entry, no? Debit tayo ng investment income, credit tayo ng investment in, associate. For the inventory class, kasi ang sabi doon, di ba, na benta daw lahat ng inventory for the current year. So, kung nabenta na lahat, then tanggalin na natin sa ating records. So, i-debit na natin sa investment income na 1 million, credit natin sa investment in associate, 1 million. Lastly, yung sa 800,000, yung excess net fair value, no? na sobrahan na tayo ng, or mas malaki na yung value ng uh, net assets na acquire natin compared sa binayad natin. So, with that, um, Sabi ng standard, dapat daw i-recognize natin siya as income. So this is the our entry. Debit tayo ng investment in associate, 800,000. Credit tayo ng investment, income at 800,000. So this will be our um, P account no, for your investment in associate account. So una, you'll have your 15 million, 
yung sa pag-acquire. Ito yung share natin sa ating um, profit na 8 million. Uh, this one is yung ating um, nirecognize no, na excess net fair value. So, kasi nagdagda, nadagda, nadagdagan ang ating investment in associate na based on this entry here sa baba. For your credits, uh, una is yung sa cash dividends na natanggap natin, uh, 2 million. Another is yung amortization natin sa depreciable na equipment. And also yung um, na-recognized, inamortized natin, tinanggal natin na um, excess, no? attributable to inventory, which was sold already uh, during 20, uh, 20, uh, during this year, no? in the current year. Kasi di ba, na, naka, ano na daw siya? Naka, nabenta niya lahat ng inventory. For your investment income naman, ito niyo yung ating uh, T-account. So, start tayo dito sa investment income. Share natin sa net income. So, that's 8 million. And then, yung sa net uh, fair value or excess net fair value na 800,000. And then, ito amortization. Ito din yung ating inventory na nabenta na no? uh, during the current year. So, yung investment income natin ay 7.1 million. Usually, class, no, problems, mga MCQ, mga tana siya, pila may investment in associate na balanse as of this particular date. So, what you have to do is you just consider all of those items na uh, dapat na consider. And what are those? Una, share in the, share in the net income, and then um, cash dividends received, and then pag merong excess of cost over carrying amount, amortization of those if related to depreciable asset. Um, and then, if ever merong excess a net uh, fair value, no? so you have also to uh, consider that because it will affect your investment in associate account as well as your uh, investment income. Okay, so proceed tayo sa next na topic. Ito, invest with heavy losses. Di ba ma-imagine nyo? Um, if the investor will be recognizing its share in the profit or loss of the investee, so ano nala ang mangyayari kung ang investee ay palaging nagre-report ng loss? Baka kulangin na ang investment ni uh, investor. No? Baka maubos na lang sa kakakredit ng um, or sa kaka-recognize na investment loss, tsaka magkakredit tayo ng, of course, investment in associate. So, now, anong gagawin? No? Pag ganun, pag palaging nagre-report ng loss ang investee. So, PS28 provides that if an investor's share of losses of an associate equals or exceeds the carrying amount of an investment, the investor discontinues no, recognizing its share of further losses. So in short, hindi pwedeng mag-report tayo ng negative or diba, hindi pwedeng mag-report tayo na nakakredit ang investment in associate account kasi nga it's an asset so dapat nakadebit siya. So kung palagi na lang nagre-report ng loss ang ating investee, so, tapos na-zero na out na, na naubos na, yung investment in associate account ni uh, investor, kakakredit, no? Kasi palagi merong nire-report na loss si investee. So, ang gagawin, pag sobra-sobra na talaga, mag-stop na muna ng pag-recognize ng losses. The investment is reported at nil or zero. So, yung investment in associate account mo, mazi-zero siya. Pero meron ka, of course, no, you have to um, disclose that in your notes of financial statement that um, naka-investment na this much sana to this particular associate except that uh, they have been um, reporting so much losses and that you have to stop recognizing the losses. No? So you have to just account for it no para or disclose it para alam ng users of the 
financial statement no kaya ano kung ano yung nangyari so if the associate subsequently reports income o kintahay na recover na no the investor resumes including its share of such income after its share of income equals to the share of losses not recognized in short di ba kasi uh, noong na zero na yung iyong investment pero pang mga losses na hindi ka naka uh, pag-recognize. So ang sinasabi na lang standard ay huwag ka munang mag-recognize ng gain, huwag ka munang mag-recognize ng income until such time na ma-recover mo ang lahat ng losses na hindi mo pa na-recognize. No? So let's have a problem na lang no para mas madaling maintindihan. So for example here, we have an illustration no? on January 1, 2019. An investor acquired 25% of the ordinary shares of an associate for 5 million. So on this date, the identifiable assets and liabilities of the associate were measured at fair value and there's no goodwill arising from the acquisition. So the profits and losses made with the associate over the first five years of operations were um, in 2019, I loss na report ang investee 1 million so ang share ng investor niya ay 250,000 in 2020 we naging 10 million yung loss no so ang share ng investor ay 2.5 million nung 2021 mas lumobo no 2, 12 million so yung share ng investor ay 3 million by 2022 naka recover no 2 million gain or profit so yung share ng investor ay 500,000 2023, dagi 2.5. At least, naka-recover na siya. So, yung share ng investor ay 625,000. Now, how do we apply the concepts that we have discussed earlier to this one? No? So, ito yung ating um, plotting no, sa uh, losses na na-incur ng investee. So, for example, here in 2019, diba ito yung share ng investor? So what I did here So what I did here is that um check ko yung balance ng investment. So I included here the balance of the investment and if ever meron siyang unrecognized na loss. So at the start of 2019, meron pa siyang balance ng 5 million. At the end of 2019, nagreport ng loss si investee. So, meron tayong share na 250,000, no? So, yung balance na lang natin ay 4,750,000. So, to recognize that entry or that uh, loss, no? Ito yung entry natin. Debit ng loss and investment, 250. Credit investment and associate, 250. So, that is why ang natira na lang na investment account or balance ay 4,750,000. Now, noong 2020, nagkaroon ulit ng loss. So, yung share natin ay 2.5. So, ito yung entry natin, no? debit loss on investment, 2.5, credit investment in associate, 2.5. So, at that time, no, from 4,750,000, na-reduce pa siya or na-deduct pa siya ng 2.5 billion. So, yung natira na lang ay 2,250,000. Now, pagdating ng 2021, loss ulit, no? Or ng 2020, uh, pagdating ng 2021, loss ulit. This should be 2021. Loss siya, mas, mas malaki pa. No? Naging 3 million yung share ni investor sa loss ni investee. Now, take note, di ba hindi na kakasya? Yung loss, uh, yung share ng loss ni investor ay 3 million. Yung balance ng investment natin ay 2 million to 50,000 na lang. So, hindi na uubra, no? kulang na ang ating investment account. So, sabi sa standard, mag-stop ka muna until that particular time. No? I-zero out lang muna yung investment in associate. And that is why, here in 2021, again, this is 2021, debit tayo ng loss of investment, amounting na lang sa balance, no? equivalent lang sa balance ng ating investment, which is 2250000 So, Tapos, credit tayo ng investment in associate at 2,250,000. So, at this point, nung credit natin yung investment in associate account, 
ang balance ng ating investment account ay zero na. Na nag-zero na siya. Pero, meron pa tayong unrecognized na loss amounting to 750,000 as of 2021. Now, pagdating ng 2022, naka-recover. So, uh, meron na tayong share na 500,000. So, kung titignan natin, ang uh, hindi natin na-recognize na loss ay 750,000 pa. Tapos, ang recovery ay 500,000 pa lang. No? So, meron pa tayong kulang, no? unrecognized loss pa na 250,000. So, that is why as of 2022, sorry, no? 2022, wala itong 2021 class, ha? delete ito. So, hindi na ito kasama. Okay? So, as of 2022, hindi mo na tayo magre-report no? ng Um, share natin sa profit. Kasi nga, uh, hindi pa natin fully na-recover or hindi pa natin fully na-recover yung mga loss na hindi natin na-recognize. So, kulang pa tayo ng 250,000. Now, pag, pagdating ng 2023, eto na, pagdating ng 2023, uh, 2023 uh, naka-recover ulit yung company. So, meron na tayong share na 625,000. Ngayon, since 625,000 na to, and then ang Kulang na lang natin na unrecognized na loss is 250. So, in short, na-recover na natin lahat ng mga unrecognized na loss. So, therefore, pwede na tayo mag-recognize ng ating um, share sa profit, which is only equivalent to 375,000. That is after deducting the unrecognized loss of 250,000. So, that is why ang entry natin sa 2023 ay nag-debit tayo ng investment in associate. At 375,000, pwede tayo ng investment income at 375,000. Okay, so I hope that is clear. Next topic, we have uh, impairment loss. Okay. So as we know, impairment loss is diba, applicable yan sa any kind of asset. So hindi uh, hindi makakalusot yung investment account. No? So meron pa rin siyang impairment loss. No? You have to recognize impairment loss class no? for all asset kapag merong mga indications na impaired na yung asset. Kasi hindi tayo pwedeng mag-report ng sobra-sobrang value ng asset. No? So as much as possible, we don't want to overstate our asset. So that's why we have to recognize impairment if the circumstances will warrant na impaired na nga yung asset. So past 28 requires that an impairment loss shall be recognized whenever the carrying amount of the investment in associate exceeds the recoverable amount. So kung sobra, Uh, no, kung mas malaki ang carrying amount ng ating investment associate compared sa recoverable amount, then we have to recognize impairment loss. So, how do we define no, a recoverable amount? So, per PS28 class, itong recoverable amount is the higher between the fair value less cost of disposal and the value in use. I suppose, Uh, alam na natin kung ano yung fair value less cost of disposal. No? Uh, ito na lang value in use. Itong value in use class, um, this is actually um, equivalent to what we call the present value of all the future cash flows related to this investment. No? So, yun yung value in use. No? Compute tayo ng present value ng ating future cash flows related sa investment na to. Or, yung tinatawag nating mga discounted na cash flow. So, kung ano ang mas mataas sa kanila or mas malaki sa kanila, i-compare mo lang itong dalawang amount na to, fair value less cost of disposal, tapos value in use. Kung saan ang mas malaking amount, yun yung i-consider natin as recoverable amount. So, yung recoverable amount dito, i-compare natin sa carrying amount. Kung mas malaki itong carrying amount compared sa recoverable amount, it means that We have to bring 
the balance of your carrying amount equal to your recoverable amount. No? Kasi hindi pwedeng lumampas tayo doon sa recoverable amount. So, whichever is um, lower sa kanila. So, kung lower yung carrying amount, may wala tayong impairment. Pero pag uh, lower ang recoverable amount, so may mas malaki itong carrying amount, ibig sabihin, we really need to, uh, to recognize impairment. Another concept pertaining to um, equity method, ito class applicable if the investee has more than one type of share. So, ibig sabihin, what if the investee uh, is, uh, has also no, preference shares aside from ordinary shares? So, ano yung bearing niya sa pag-compute natin ng uh, profit? Uh, yung share natin sa profit ng investee. So, sabi dito, when the preference shares or when the investee no, has preference shares, again, meron siyang bearing sa pag-compute natin ng share ng investor doon sa profit ng um, investee. Now, take note that when the preference shares are cumulative, No, yung cumulative, meaning even if hindi nag-declare ng dividends ang corporation, still um, mag a yun. So, the moment na mag-declare ng dividends ang corporation, uh, entitled yung mga preference shareholders who are um, holding no, mga cumulative na preference shares. So, if this is the case, no, kapag ang preference shares are cumulative class, Uh, before tayo mag-compute ng share natin sa profit no sa investee, the investor no has to deduct first the preference dividends. Whether such preference dividends are declared or not. So kapag cumulative, even if it is not declared yet, no even if the dividend is not declared, still you have to deduct First, no, i-adjust muna natin yung uh, profit ni investee before tayo mag-compute ng share natin uh, sa profit ng investee na i-report of course natin sa ating uh, libro. Now, kapag naman non-cumulative ang uh, preference shares, so take note na i-deduct lang natin ito or i-deduct lang natin yung preference dividends only when such dividend is declared. So, yun yung kaibahan, no? Na kapag merong preference shares ang invest, i-check muna natin ano bang klaseng preference, uh, preference shares nila. Uh, is it a cumulative preference shares or non-cumulative? Kasi pag cumulative, affected ang ating uh, pag-compute ng uh, share sa profit, no? Kay investee. So, pag cumulative, we, we really have to deduct the preference dividends no uh, from the net income or from the profit before ta mag-compute og share nato sa profit na ay kay investee pero kung non-cumulative gani bisan uh, kung non-cumulative gani dili nato i-deduct ang preference dividends kung wala siya gi-declare so we will just deduct it no i-adjust lang natin yung profit um na magiging basihan natin sa ating profit na ire-report or as share sa ating profit ni investee kapag ang preference dividends na to are declared. So, pag hindi declared, so wala na. No? Ignore na lang natin yung preference dividends. So, meron ditong sample. No? An investor reported uh, the following capital accounts at the beginning of the year. So, meron siyang preference share capital, 12%. Take note, cumulative. Itong 12% na to, this represents the dividend rate. So, ibig sabihin, itong preference share shares na to ay makakatanggap ng 12% no, na um, dividend based on the uh, par value of the preference share. So, with this, um, Cumulative siya, no? So, it has bearing. 
Ordinary share capital, uh, 50 pesos yung par value, 500,000 ang shares na authorized, tapos 200,000 na shares issued. So that's 50 par value times 200,000 share issued. So that's 10 million. Tapos ang retained earnings niya ay 5 million. So these are just given, no? given information ito. So on the same date, the investor an investor acquired 40,000 ordinary shares of the investee representing um, 20% interest for 3 million. The net assets of the investee are fairly valued. So ibig sabihin walang excess of cost over carrying amount or um, net fair value. No? Excess of net fair value. So the investor reported net income of 2 million for the current year and paid cash dividends of 500,000 to ordinary shareholders and the preference dividends at the preference rate. So how do we account? No? Kasi atong issue diri is uh, unsa na to pag-compute sa tuang share sa profit. No? Kasi we have to compute profit, di ba? Kanina yung single lang or isa lang ang ang shares na minimaintain ng or inissue ng investee, diretsa lang man ta, percentage multiplied by the net income na diretsa. Pero this time kasi dalawa yung uh, inissue na shares ni investee there's still a need for us to adjust no, our net income before nato siya i-multiply sa ito ang ownership interest. So, these are our entries. No? Una, to pagpalit. So, you have 3 million. So, this one, sorry. So, you have pagpalit sa investor kasi we are accounting in the point of view of the investor. So, dito. No? So, when the investor acquired it, yung 40,000 ordinary shares, for 3 million, ito yung entry natin. So, debit tayo ng investment in associate, 3 million, credit tayo ng cash. Now, what about the share in the net income? So, this will be our um, entry. So, paano natin kanumpit ng 280,000? So, take note, preference shares are cumulative. So, whether or not they are declared or uh, they are declared or kung i-declare man sila or hindi, we really have to deduct the preference share na dividend. So, saan ba galing ito? At again, itong 12% na to, this is your um, preference or dividend rate no, for the preference shares as um, indicated here no, dito. Ito siya. Tapos ang sabi, cumulative siya. Tapos, um, par value niya ay 100, equivalent to 5 million. So, dito, um, paano na natin kinumpit yung preference share? So that's 12 uh, 12 multiplied by the par value no yung I mean the total preference share uh, shares at par value so that's uh 5000 bayon or that's 50 uh, that's 50000 shares times 500 uh, times 100 pesos or ito na lang 5 million no so that's uh 12% of 5 million so that's 600000 so, ibig sabihin, sa net income na 2 million, 600 mapupunta muna sa mga preference shareholders. So, yung sobra na lang yung um, paghahatian no, ng mga ordinary shareholders. Kasi, di ba, preference shares are preferred as to dividends. So, uunahin yan sila. No? Priority yung mga preference shareholders. So, with that, ang uh, income na lang applicable to ordinary ay 1.4 billion. So, i-multiply natin yan ng ownership interest na investor na 20%. So, the share in the net income is 280,000. So, ito yung ating entry. Debit investment in associate, credit investment income for 280,000. Next is our share in the cash dividend. So, yung cash dividend, ang na-mention doon, di ba 500,000 daw. So, since 20% yung ating interest, or ownership no in the investee. So multiply lang natin ng 20% yung 500,000. So meron tayong 100,000. And of course, ito yung entry natin no. Uh, nakatanggap tayo ng cash and with the corresponding decrease in our investment in associate account. Okay? So that's the 
accounting no kapag merong um preference shares ang invest fee. Hindi lang isa yung minimentin niya. So, let's proceed to the other changes in equity. Other changes in equity. So, if you have noticed, class, di ba, ang ginawa natin uh, kanina, um, we compute, no, we recognize our share in the profit or loss of the investee. So, kasi nga, di ba, uh, most probably, pag merong profit, yung total uh, net assets ng company ay nag increase din. No? So, kasi taken up siya doon sa profit or loss. So, most probably, nag increase ang ang kanyang net assets ng, uh, ng investee. Now, what if class, no, that there are changes in the equity, meaning not change yung net asset ng uh, investee, pero hindi siya dumaon doon sa profit or loss. Kasi di ba, if you can still recall, ang ating statement of uh, comprehensive income, two parts yun. One is the profit or loss, the other one is the OCI. So what if there are changes, for example, in the asset of the investee, pero hindi siya dumaan sa profit or loss. Doon siya dumiret siya sa OCI. So ano yung effect niya? Di ba? Parang um, dapat dapat mang good no ang ato ang i-recognize sa investment in associate is mo equate siya sa percentage no uh, sa percentage na we owned for that particular investee now ang mahitabo is if na yung mga changes in equity nga wala din agi sa profit or loss ang mahitabo is um murag mo understate ang atong investment in associate so that is why uh, this is the Um, parang ito yung dapat nating gawin no ito yung dapat nating gawin para ma-update yung uh, records din natin sa investment in associate na account if ever there are changes in the equity um kailan yan no ano yung mga possible scenarios na uh, ma-change uh, or there are changes in the equity so we have here adjustments to the carry amount of the investment in associate maybe necessary no for Changes daw in the investor's proportionate interest in the investee. Arising from changes in the investor's equity that have not been recognized in the investor's profit or loss. So yung sinasabi ko no, na baka nag-change yung net assets ng investee na hindi naman dumaan or hindi naman in-report doon sa profit or loss. Kung hindi, doon sa OCI. So ano yung examples na mga changes na yan? So, eto no common example what if nagrevalue si investee sa iya ang property plant and equipment no na nahitabo nga revaluation so what will happen nag increase ang asset ni um investee nag increase ang yang equity because nag recognize man siya sur, uh, sur, uh, revaluation surplus pero of course that revaluation surplus this did not um was not presented or was not reported in the profit or loss. So most probably, hindi siya na-take up ni investor. Or itong foreign exchange na translation differences, no? yung fluctuations ng um, mga foreign exchange or mga foreign currencies. So yan, nire-report yan sa OCI kasi it's just a result of uh, valuation. Or even yung mga uh, unrealized gain or loss na OCI No? So, hindi siya mare-report uh, doon sa profit or loss but sa OCI. Now, ano yung issue dito? Na yung, anong concern natin? So, ang concern natin is kung hindi siya dumaan sa profit or loss cas, most probably, hindi siya matatake up ng investor. So, kung hindi siya matatake up sa libro ng investor, hindi mag equate or hindi magiging proportionate, magiging disbalance, no? Or, magiging understated ang investment account ni investor. So anong da uh, anong dapat gawin? So nandito na no? sabi ng standard, the investor's share of those changes is recognized directly in the equity of the investor. So in short, we still have to recognize um that change, no? That change in that equity, the increase in the the increase in the asset for example, tapos we do not report it also in the profit or loss instead we report it directly to the equity section 
So, meron tayong sample dito para mas maintindihan. So, here the, inv uh, the investment in associate is 20%, no? As a consequence of which the investor has significant influence. cash dividend. So, the cash dividend here is uh, 2 million yung dineclare. So, 20% man yung iyong um, ownership. So, you'll be receiving 400,000 and agreed tayo ng investment in associate. So, aside from those changes in the equity um, or changes no in the um, records of the investee, meron pa ito, no, yung salary valuation surplus. So, uh, look at this class, no. Nag-recognize tayo ng share natin sa revaluation surplus and then we are going to directly report this in our equity section. So, ito, debit tayo na investment in associate equivalent to uh, 600,000, that's 20% of 3 million. Tapos, credit natin siya sa revaluation surplus investee. So, ito siya, hindi siya mag- um, a appear sa ating profit or loss statement but doon siya sa OCI and later it will be presented in your equity section. So let's proceed now to other um, accounting concerns or accounting issues related to investment in associate. Now, di ba class, ang Isa sa mga natutunan natin is that ang uh, investor and ang investee ay considered one single economic unit. And that is why the investor will um, recognize its share in the profit or loss of the investee. No, di ba? Mag-recognize man siya ng share niya sa profit or loss. So having said that, since... Uh, mag-recognize siya ng profit or ng share niya sa profit and loss ng investee. So, di ba ma-imagine yun? Ano ba magiging basis ngayon ni investor pag-compute niya ng share niya sa uh, profit or loss ng investee? So, kaya dito papasok yung mga adjustments no, na investee para makater yung information needs ni investor. So, sabi dito, no, um, the most recent available financial statements of the associate no, are used by the investor in applying the equity method. Kasi of course, ano, mo, ano bang pagbabasihan ni investor? Yung financial statements ni investee. Kasi dyan, siya, uh, dyan niya tata, uh, titingnan kung magkano bang nireport na profit ni investee. No, kasi yun yung magiging basis niya sa kanyang um, i-record no, na share niya sa profit. Now, since iyon yung magiging basis ni investor sa pag-compute ng share niya sa profit, now there is a need no, for the associate or for the investee to prepare financial statements as of the same date with the financial statements of the investor unless it is not practical to do so. So, ano ibig sabihin? Sa example, no, yung si investee, ang gamit niya ay calendar year. Nag-end siya ng December 31. Tapos si investor, ang gamit niya ay fiscal year. Nag-end siya ng um, June 30, for example. June 30 yung end niya, yung cut-off period niya. So, malayo masyado ang gap no, ng financial statement ni investor tsaka financial statement ni investee. So, ang sinasabi lang dito na kung ganun class, dapat si investee mag-prepare siya ng financial statements para may magamit si investor. No? Para makater niya yung information needs ni investor. Uh, as long as it is not impractical no? na gawin. Kasi baka masyadong costly, for example. No? So, kung, uh, kung hindi siya practical, so, 
pwede namang hindi na lang. As long as uh, you have to make also some corrections no? for uh, para sa consumption ni investor. Now, if an associate uses accounting policies other than those of the investors, so ibig sabihin, uh, what if hindi pareho yung mga accounting policies na ginamit ni investor at ni investee? For example, um, ang gamit ni investor kay FIFO method, whereas ang gamit ni investee kay average cost or weighted average cost. No? So, what will happen? Sabi dito, um, dapat no um si investi mag prepare ng financial statements na magconform doon sa accounting policies ni investor so again no this is just to cater the information needs of the investor para hindi siya mahirapan na uh, i-account yung kanyang investment in associate so dapat mag provide si investi ng um appropriate na mga financial statements para maging basihan ni investor. The last one is, ito, no, um, since considered as one single economic unit sa investor sa ka-investee, kapag merong mga intercompany transactions, no, si investor sa ka si investee, ang tawag dito mga upstream sa ka-downstream transactions. So, ibig sabihin lang, Um, may mga transactions na between the investor and the investee which has resulted to a profit or loss. Okay? So, ang sinasabi dito, kapag merong mga profit or losses, which is a consequence of an upstream or downstream transaction between an investor and an associate, these are recognized in the investor's financial statements only to the extent no, of the unrelated investor's interest in the associate. So, anong ibig sabihin nun? Um, just to simplify it, ang ibig sabihin lang, class, is that um, dapat tanggalin natin yung mga profit and losses sa mga transactions no, uh, pertaining to investor and investee. Especially if hindi pa na-realize yung um, profit or losses na yan. So, in what sense na hindi pa na-realize ang profit or losses? So, for example, etong si investor bumili ng um, inventory ka investi. So, for example, ganun, no? merong, merong uh, inter-company uh, na transaction. So, if, for example, the inventory, no? hindi pa siya nabenta or nasa hands pa siya ni investor at the end of the accounting period. So, ibig sabihin nun, hindi pa talaga na-realize yung nireport na profit ni investi kasi hindi pa nakalabas ng uh, company ang inventory. So, ang sinasabi lang dito, dapat tanggalin yun. No? I-eliminate natin yung mga um, profit or losses resulting from upstream and downstream transactions. So later we will discuss ano ba yung upstream and downstream transactions. So pag sinabi nating upstream transactions class, these are those transactions no that involves selling of assets from an associate to the investor. You know, gikan sa associate padulong sa investor. So na maligya ang seller si associate ang buyer si investor. So, ang sinasabi lang dito na kapag merong unrealized profit from these transactions, they must be eliminated in determining the investor's share in the profit or loss of the associate. No? So, tanggalin natin kasi ma-overstate or madadoble uh, yung um, profit. No? Kasi magre-report ng profit si... Um, invest uh, si associate or si investee, eh, hindi pa naman talaga realize kasi hindi pa nga na benta ni investor. So we have here an example, no? sale of inventory from associate to investor. So in January 1, 2019, for example, an, an investor acquired 20% interest in 
an investee, enabling the investor to exercise significant influence over the investee. On this date, the uh, identifiable asset and liabilities of the investee are recorded at fair value. So during the year, the investor reported a net income of $2 million and paid no dividend. Also during the year, the investee sold inventory costing $200,000 for $300,000 to the investor. So na siya gross profit niya, $100,000. So the inventory is unsold by the investor on December 31, 2019. So ignoring the income tax, the investor's share in the profit of the associate for 2019 is computed as follows. So you have your 2019 net income na 2 million. Kasi di ba ito yung nireport ni ito yung nireport ni investing na net income niya. So yung 2 million na yan, kasama dyan yung gross profit na related doon sa inventory na binili ni investor na hindi pa niya nabenta as of December 31, 2019. So, hindi pa nakalabas kay investor yung inventory. So, therefore, it is considered pa as unrealized. So, ang ginawa, tanggalin muna natin, no, eliminate natin yung unrealized profit. So, tinanggal yung 100,000 so you'll have your uh, your adjusted net income of 1.9 million. So that 1.9 million, yan yung ating multiply sa 20%. So yung share the investor sa net income investee na adjusted ay ito lang 380,000. Okay? So if you are to continue the illustration na pagka next year na so, what if pagka next year, um, nag-report ng net income si investi na 2.5 million. Now, this time, yung inventory na hawak ni investor ay nabenta na niya. Na nabenta na ni investor. So, since nabenta na siya, considered na yun as realized profit no? ni, um, invest, ni investi. So, that is why here, we have to adjust again the net income, integrating now the realized profit na nandoon sa beginning inventory. So, in add natin yung 100,000. So, the adjusted net income is 2.6 billion, and this becomes the basis no, of our um, share or pag compute ng share natin sa profit ni investor or the investee. So, that's a total of 5. 120,000. Next is for downstream transactions. So ito namang downstream transactions baliktad. No? It's a sale of asset from the investor naman to an associate. So most probably, ganun din dapat no, na pag may mga unrealized profit from these transactions, it must be eliminated in determining the investor share in the profit or loss of the associate. However, class, itong downstream transaction, wala siyang clear-cut guidance no, per PES 28 kung paano siya tanggalin from the unre uh, kung paano itanggalin ang unrealized profit or loss no, in a downstream transaction. So, leave moon lang muna natin yan. Meron pa tayo dito isa pa example, uh, sale of depreciable asset. Kasi diba, um, kanina inventory, na-realize siya nung nabenta siya. So what about depreciable asset? For depreciable asset naman, uh, marirealize lang siya kapag nagamit mo. So meaning, if there's a passage of time, so most probably, uh, you'll be able to realize no, yung, yung unrealized na profit associated doon sa pagbenta ng equipment or ng depreciable asset from the associate to uh, the investor. Okay? So, in this particular problem, an investor acquired 20% in an associate. So, during the year, the investee sold an equipment with a carry amount of 4.5 million to the investor for 7 million. So, this is still an upstream transaction, but this time involving sale of depreciable asset. So, the equipment has a remaining useful life of five years and the investor reported net income of 6 million for 2019. 
Ignoring the income tax, the investor share and the profit of the associate in 2019 is determined as follows. So, yung net income natin in 2019 is 6 million no? as given. Dito, given na siya. So, yung unrealized profit natin on the sale of equipment, saan galing yung 2.5 billion? That is just simply uh, yung carrying amount na 4.5 uh, compared to the selling price of 7 million. So, that's 7 million minus 4.5. No? Yung 2.5 na yan, yan yung unrealized profit related to the sale of equipment. So, since unrealized pa man siya, motogi, deduct sa siya sa net income. Kay na-appeal naman na dira sa 6 million. So, manang we are deducting it para tanggalun sa siya sa 6 million. Since unrealized pa man. Now, since nangyari yung sale noong January 1, 2019, so most probably, pagdating ng December 31, 2019, nagamit na ni investor ang uh, equipment for one year. So that is why a portion of it is already realized. No? So, mo ni siya pag-compute no, na ang katong 2.5 million na itong unrealized profit, ato siya i-divide ang 5 years, kaya ang 5 years na lang man daw ang remaining life aning equipment. So karon niya 2 egg, since nagamit naman nato siya, na-realize na nato ang 500,000. So that is why our adjusted net income here is 4 million. So this 4 million, muna na siya ito ang mahimong basihan pag compute na karon sa share ni investor sa profit ni investee. So that's 20% of 4 million, that's 800,000. So if you are to continue the illustration, so pagka next year na po, no, na natay net income nga 8 million daw ni investee. So, si investor ka ron, uh, iyan na pong i-report o i-recognize na po to niya itong realized na profit. No? Nga itong nagamit naman po ng equipment for 2020. So, naka-realize uh, naka na po siya profit ng 500,000. So, the adjusted net income ngayon ay 8.5 million. So, 8.5 million na yan, i-multiply lang natin sa percentage interest no? or ownership interest ni investor ka investi so muna na siya ang share nato sa um, profit ni investi okay so eto no next what if but discontinue na ang equity method or in what instances na hindi pwede na i-account natin ang ating investment in shares using the equity method so, sabi dito, no, according to past 28, when an investor ceases to have significant influence over an investee, it shall discontinue to use equity method from that date. So, pag wala ng significant influence, hindi na pwedeng i-account ang investment natin under equity method. So, consequently, um, the investor shall account the investment as follows. So, mamimili na lang dito sa tatlo. So, pwede niya i-account as financial asset at fair value through profit or loss or financial asset at, uh, asset at fair value through OCI or as non-marketable in investment at cost or investment in unquoted equity instrument which will be, of course, no, um, accounted using the cost method. Okay? So, Next is we have, ano yung gagawin natin, no? How do we measure our investment after there is a loss of significant influence? So, ang sinasabi ng past 28, um, on the deep daw of the significant influence is lost, the investor shall measure, no? Any retained investment. Yung mga natira nating investment in associate, dapat i-measure natin siya at fair value. Tapos, the difference between the carrying amount of the fair value of, of the uh, the carrying amount and the fair value of the retained investment shall be included in the profit or loss. So, so again, uh, pag nawala na ang significant influence, dapat i-remeasure muna yung natirang investment at fair value. Yung difference ng fair value at yung carrying amount, i-report natin siya sa profit or 
law. So, i-report natin siya as gain on remeasurement. So, we have here an illustration. So, an entity purchased 30,000 ordinary shares of the 100,000 outstanding shares of another entity representing 30% interest several years ago. So, in short, noon, di ba, uh, investment and associate talaga siya. Meron siya significant influence. At year end, the investment and associate has a carry amount of 6 million. So, on the same date, the investor sold 20,000 shares. So, of the 30,000 shares, binenta na niya ang 20,000 shares for net proceeds of 5 million, resulting to a loss of significant influence. Kasi from 30,000, naging 10,000 na lang ang kanyang ownership. So, wala na siyang significant influence. So, the quoted market price for such investment is 260 per share at the date of sale. Okay, so anong gagawin natin? So, una, to record the sale of 20,000 shares. Ito yung ating entry. Debit tayo ng cash at 5 million. Credit tayo ng investment and associate. So, paano natin kinumpute yung amount? That's uh, 20,000 shares man yung nabenta divided by 30,000 shares, yung total na number of shares na owned by the investor. Minu uh, minultiply lang natin siya sa carrying amount as of uh, that day na nabenta niya ang kanyang investment. So, the cost of the investment na binenta ay 4 million. So, with that, um, meron tayong sobra. No? We have a gain on sale of investment amounting to 100,000. So, the next thing, ang sabi doon sa standard, uh, on the date of the loss of significant influence, dapat i-remeasure mo yung natirang uh, investment at fair value. So, that is why here, ang ginawa natin ay ito, no? Rinemeasure siya. So, based on the problem, ang fair value daw ng shares, no? Noong time na yon ay 260 per share. So, since ang natirang number of shares ay 10,000 shares, so times 260, so the total fair value of the retained shares ay 2.6 million. Tapos, dinidak na lang natin yung carrying amount no, na natira. So, from 6 million, dinidak natin yung 4 million. So, yung carrying amount ay 2 million na lang. So, there is an increase no, amounting to 600,000. So, sabi sa standard, ang excess, no, ang difference ng fair value of the retained shares and the carrying amount of the retained shares shall be presented in your profit or loss. So that is why here we are crediting it to gain from remeasurement to fair value. So we are increasing the investment in associate account. So from 2 million, maging 2.6 million siya. And we recognize again from a remeasurement to fair value amounting to 600,000. So after this entry, uh, pwede na natin i-reclassify no, yung ating asset or yung ating investment. So we debit here, i-reclassify niya at fair value through profit or loss. So depende lang sa problem. No? So dito kasi ang kanyang um, investment ay classified as financial asset at fair value through profit or loss. So, dinebit natin yan at 2.6. Tapos, credit natin ang investment in associate at 2.6. So, with this entry, ma-zero out na ang ating investment in associate account. So, na-transfer na siya to financial assets at fair value through profit or loss. Next topic is itong uh, what if your associate is held for sale na? So meaning um, you don't have anymore the intention of receiving dividends. Wala na ka intention na nausab ang yung mga huna, huna So instead na magpaabot ka sa mga dividends, sa mga capital appreciation, for example, um, you are now decided to just uh, sell your associate. No? You're just holding it and you have the intention of selling it. So, uh, PAS 28 provides that if the invested associate is classified as held for sale, it shall be accounted under PFRS 5. 
So, ang sabi dito, um, kapag ang investment in associate ay classified as held for sale, it shall be measured at the lower of carrying amount and the fair, fair value less cost of disposal. So, yan lang man yung sinasabi niya. Now, what if the investment of the investor is less than 20%? Now, how do we account for that? Kasi we've been talking about investments 20% or more and that meron siyang significant influence. Now, what if the investment is less than 20%? No? So therefore, we are, we are assuming that pag less than 20%, walang significant influence no? ang investor kay investee. And if that's the case, uh, they are treated as independent from each other. So, the investor and investor are independent from each other. So, for example, ikaw meron ka ownership na 10%. Wala ka naka-exercise of significant influence. So, meaning, uh, dili ka pwede mo record o share ni mo sa profit no, sa uh, investee. Because in the first place, you two are considered two different na economic entities. Unlike noon sa equity section or sa equity method or doon sa meron kang significant influence na ang treatment sa iyo na investor tsaka ng investee ay isang single economic unit lang. So dito, pag walang significant influence, pag less than sa 20% ang iyong investment, then you are considered as independent. No? The investor and investor are considered independent from each other. And that is why, um, pag ganito ang klaseng investment, you have to account it using the fair value method or the cost method. So, these two items here na discuss na natin in the previous natin na lesson. So, yung fair value depende lang yan no? kung fair value through profit or loss ba siya or fair value through OCI. And then, yung cost method applicable ito kapag unquoted ang ating ang ating um, investment in shares. Now, uh, just to point out no, the difference between the cost method and the equity method. So, una is uh, in terms of atong sa profit, no? sa recognition sa profit or loss. Under the equity method, diba, we have to recognize share of the investor sa profit or loss ng investee. However, in the cost method class, hindi natin yan gagawin. Delete mo report o um, delete nato i-recognize ang share nato sa profit or loss sa investee. So in short under the cost method we just ignore that no we do not take it to consideration we do not compute for our share in the net income of the investee Another thing is that uh, in terms of cash dividends na received So under the equity method ang cash dividends na received ng company di ba credit credit yan to uh, investment in associate accounts so in short it is considered as a deduction sa ating investment account. However, under the cost method, ang treatment niyan class ay dividend income. If you can still recall, di ba? Cash dividends, property dividends, when you receive it, you credit it to dividend income. So that is applying the cost method of accounting your investment. Okay, so we're almost done. So, ito siya. Um, what if you achieve no, or the investment in associate is achieved in, in stages? Ano ibig sabihin ito? Ibig sabihin na sa kakabili mo ng shares ng isang corporation or isang company, dumating ang point na nagkaroon ka na ng significant influence. Kasi lubaki na yung number of shares mo or no, yung, yung relationship ninyo ni investee ay uh, ano na, nag-iba na. No? Meron ka ng significant influence over the investee. So here, it is considered as investment in associate achieved in stages. So anong, ga anong, anong gagawin? No? Ano bang scenario? So for example lang, Klasa, um, so first tier, for example, you just purchase 10%. So, 10%, it will not give you significant influence. So, you are going to account for it. So, for example, if it is uncoated, so, i-account mo yan under the um, cost method. No? Sa cost method siya. Now, pagka next year, bumili ka ulit ng 10%. So, pagka next year, naging 20% na yung total 
investment mo. So, for example lang, on that on that point, no, uh, nagkaroon ka na ng significant influence over the investee. So, yun sinasabi natin, investment in associate achieved in stages. Hindi siya one time no, na uh, nagkaroon ka ng significant influence. So, anong gagawin natin pag investment associate achieve in stages? No? Ano yung ating concern? So, PFRS3 provides that in a business combination achieved in stages, the acquirer shall remeasure the previously held equity instrument or in interest at fair value and recognize the resulting gain or loss in profit or loss. Okay, so ganyan yung ating gagawin. So meron siyang mga accounting um, procedures dito. No? So under the fair value approach, so what are you going to do? The existing interest in the associate is remeasured at fair value with any change in the fair value included in the profit or loss. So, before ta mo uh, reclassify no, sa ato ang um, dati nga investment in shares, we have to remeasure muna um, we have to remeasure muna uh, you still have to remeasure them. I remeasure muna natin sila. No, yung existing natin na um, ownership. So, i-remeasure muna natin sila at fair value. And kapag merong mga changes uh, in the fair value, then you have to include that in the profit or loss. Second, if the existing interest is accounted for at FV or fair value through OCI, any unrealized gain or loss at the date the investee becomes an associate, shall be reclassified to retained earnings. If you can still recall, pag FBOCI, di ba, hindi siya pwedeng i-revert to profit or loss. So that is why pag um, on the date na naging investment and associate yun, dapat i-reclassify muna natin yung unrealized gain or loss OCI to retained earnings. Third, the fair value of the existing interest plus the cost of the additional interest acquired constitutes the total cost of the investment for the initial application of the equity method. So, at this point, diba, um, yung total fair value na existing na shares mo plus yung cost na dinagdag mong shares, that will comprise your total cost na investment. So, yun yung maging initial basis mo sa uh, pag-account under the equity method. So, the total cost of investment for the initial application of the equity method minus the carrying amount of the net assets acquired at the date significant influence is obtained equals the excess of cost over the carrying amount or excess of net fair value. So, let's try to figure that out, itong mga concepts na to, in an illustration. Okay, so in this particular problem or illustration, uh, this is an example of yung achieved in stages, investment in associate, achieved in stages, wherein ang original niya na investment is accounted under the cost method. So from cost method, gawin natin equity method. So ano yung mga uh, gagawin natin, no? uh, mga accounting concerns or issues na dapat natin tandaan. So on January 1, 2019, an investor acquired a 10% interest in an investee for 2 million. So the investment is accounted for under the cost method because the investment is uncoated. So on January 1, 2021, the investor acquired further 20% interest in the investee for, 80, uh, for 4 million. On such date, the carrying amount of the net assets of the invest is 18 million. Okay? So, 18 million yung kanyang net assets carrying amount. Any excess of cost over the carrying amount is attributable to an undervalued equipment with the remaining useful life of 5 years. So, on January 1, 2021, the existing investment has a fair value of 2.5 million. 
The investor reported the following net income and dividends no, from 2019 until 2021. So, paano natin i-account to? So, mag-start tayo with 2019. So, noong 2019, bumili tayo ng investment. And this investment, if we are to recall, no, based on the problem, these are unquoted. So, 10% lang. So, of course, you have to account it at uh, using cost method. So, dito, debit tayo ng investment in shares at 2 million or investment in equity securities na 2 million. Then, credit tayo ng cash 2 million. So, that's the time when we purchase no, yung 10,000, uh, yung 10% interest no, for 2 million. Now, in 2019, kasi cost method ang gamit natin dito, no, kung babalikan lang natin ang kanyang net income tsaka cash dividends na report Ito. So, kung natin, in 2019 class, uh, cost method pa itong gamiton. So, kay cost method pa man, wala tayo share sa net income. Tapos, ang ato ang cash dividend, i-consider nato siya as dividend income. So, morning sa 2019, morning atong entry, no? Nag-debit ako cash, which is 10% of the 800,000. So, you have 80,000. And credit tayo ng dividend income at 80,000. Now, in 2020, ganun din. No, wala pa ta naka-exercise uh, of significant influence. So, again, ng 3 million, dead ma lang natin na, ignore lang natin na siya. Tapos, your cash dividend of 1 million, i-multiply natin siya by uh, 10%. So, you'll have 100,000. And that 100,000 is a consider nato siya as dividend income. Now, in 2021, this is the time when you're able to achieve you know, the um, katong na siya significant influence. So, may mo na siyang investment in associate. So, first is, gi-record sa niya ang iyang gipalit na bago na interest na 20%. Okay, balik ko nato diri. Uh, 20%, 4 billion iyang palit. So, take note that as of that day, the carrying amount of the net assets is 8 million. No, niya, 20% iyang ipalit. So, balik ta again sa 2021. So, money siya iyang ipalit, debit siya investment and associate 4 million, credit siya of cash. Okay? So, Another entry is to remeasure no, the existing interest at fair value. So, sabi man natin no, na katong atong daan nga, atong original to ng investment, ato siyang i-remeasure at fair value. Ato siyang estate at fair value. So, kung balikan na to ang problem, ingon siya diri, as of that day, ang existing investment has a fair value of 2.5 million. So, i-compare na to, uh, 2.5 million versus the 2 million, no? Ato ang carrying amount. So, dapat magdagdag ta o gatong 500,000. So, wani siya tong entry. Debit tag investment in shares, credit tag gain on measurement to equity. Amounting to 500,000. Okay? So, pag human and agri-measure, we can now reclassify the 10% existing interest. So, Reclassification, very simple. Now you just debit investment in associate, credit investment in shares no, for 2.5 million. Now, nung nag-report na ng net income in 2021, of course, since uh, meron naman tayong significant influence, so we have to account it under equity method. So, kung equity method, mag-compute na tao katong share sa net income. So, sa 4 million yung net income sa investee, 30% at 2A. So, that's a total of 1.2 million. So, we debit investment in associate, credit investment, income. Also, uh, in relation to the cash dividend, um, kung ano po ni siya, no? ang cash dividend nga i-declare kay pila to, uh, 2 million. So, 2 million times 30%. So, morning na atay 600. 2 million times 30%. So, na atay 600,000. And then lastly, kung kabantay mo, kaganina, um, di ba ang 
ato ang cost or ang ato ang stog ini natay uh, ginatawag na excess of cost over carrying amount so kung atong computeton ka ganina um natay existing na fair value di ba 2.5 million tapos ang atong bago na investment is 4 million so ang total cost of investment is 6.5 million now Ang um, total net assets daw as given in the problem is 18 million. So multiply lang natin yun sa ating interest uh, or sa to ang uh, ownership interest sa 30%. So ang total carrying amount of the net assets that we acquired is 5.4 million. So compare that to the total cost nga to ang nabayad or ito ang uh, na-consider which is composed of the fair value of the existing uh, shares plus the new shares. So, we will have the excess of our cost. And based on the problem, mingun siya dito nga, ang excess daw sa cost is attributable to equipment with a remaining useful life of 5 years. So, that is why here, ang atuang 1.1 million, gidivide na itong 5. So, natin amortization nga 220,000. So, one na siya itong report dito. Debit investment income, credit investment in, associate for 220,000. Okay? So that's it for cost, no? cost method, from cost method to equity method. Okay, let's proceed to the last one. What about this? What if from fair value siya, whether fair value through profit or loss or fair value through OCI? Now from fair value to uh, equity method. So, kaninga problem, ang iyang focus is, gigan siya sa fair value through OCI, then transfer siya to equity method. So, still, this is achieved in stages. So, on January 1, 2019, an investor acquired a 10% interest in an investee for 3 million. So, the investment is accounted for at fair value through other comprehensive income. So, fair value through OCI yang gamit. So, the fair value of the investment on December 31, 2019 is 4 million. So, di ba? Kung makarecall ta, uh, kung fair value through OCI na siya, pasabot, we have to compare the fair value of December 31 and our uh, carrying amount na 3 billion. So, there's a difference of 1 million, which we are going to um, account or recognize as unrealized gain OCI, amounting to 1 million. So, in January 1, 2020, the investor acquired further 30% interest in the investee for 8.5 million. So, on such date, the carrying amount of the net assets of the investee is 25 million. Any excess of costs over carrying amount is attributable to goodwill. So, dilik kay tamang problema. Kaya nga naman, if it is attributable to goodwill, wala kay tay hinumdumon or hunahunaon ng amortization at the end of the accounting period because goodwill will not be amortized but rather uh, it will be tested only for impairment. So the investor reported the following net income and dividends. No? So you have for 2019, 5 million net income, cash dividend 3.5. 2020, 6 million net income, 4 million na cash dividends. So let's proceed to the entries. So, ito yung mga journal entries natin. So, una, yung pag-recognize natin ng uh, in-acquire natin noong no, uh, 2019 uh, with a percentage of 10% lang. So, you have financial assets, FBOCI at 3 million, credit cash at 3 million. Now, since ano man ito, um, financial assets at fair value through OCI, so yung ating ma-receive na Cash dividend is to be accounted as dividend income. So, ito, no, debit tayo ng cash, 10% uh, of 3.5 million, that's 350,000, and credit tayo ng dividend income. Another thing is that since this is fair value through uh, OCI, ito yung minention ko kanina, no, na mag-compute tayo ng unrealized or mag-recognize tayo ng unrealized gain OCI. So, from 4 million, naging 5 million. So, meron tayong dagdag. No? Debit natin financial assets at fair value through OCI, 1 million. Credit and realized gain OCI at 1 million. Okay? So, ito yung ating computation ng unrealized gain OCI. So, in 2020, ayun na. No? Meron na tayong 
uh, additional 30%. So from 10 naging 40 na kasi additional 30%. So we have here, uh, debit tayo ng invest between associate at 8.5 million. Uh, para dun sa binayaran natin, uh, credit tayo ng cash no, at 8.5 million. Next is the reclassification. Kasi sabi natin, di ba, pag um, fair value through OCI siya, yung unrealized gain na meron tayo, dapat i-reclass natin siya to retained earnings. So, ito na yung ating entry. Debit unrealized gain, OCI, credit retained earnings at 1 million. So, yun yung reclassification natin. So, after that, we can now reclassify our existing 10% interest to uh, invest with an associate. So, ano na, no? Transfer na lang natin. So, debit tayo ng investment in associate at 4 million. Tama ba na 4 million? Parang dapat 5 million ito. No, kasi ito yung ating magkano na ba yung investment in associate? Uh, yung investment or yung financial asset at fair value through OCI natin. Diba dapat um, from Ah, okay. Sorry. From 3 million, naging 4 million pala siya. No? So, from 3 million, naging 4 million. So, ang existing natin na balance ng financial assets at fair value ay 4 million. So, yan. No? 3 million plus another 1 million. So, you have 4 million. So, uh, i-reclassify lang natin yun. No? I-debit natin sa investment and associate. Credit natin sa financial asset. FBOCI. So, since tayo ay meron na significant influence, equity method na, then we can now recognize share in our net income in 2020. So, that's 40% of 6 million. So, you debit investment in associate, 2.4 million. Credit investment income at 2.4 million. Another is the share in your cash dividend. So, debit tayo ng cash, credit tayo ng investment in associate. So, just take note class no, na... Um, Yung meron tayong excess of cost over carrying amount. No? Computed as like this one. Uh, fair value of existing 10% uh, interest or shares. That's 4 million. Add natin yung cost ng ating 30% na new interest na 8.5. So yung total cost ng investment natin ay 12.5 million. Ang carrying amount ng net assets na acquire natin ay 40% ng 25 million. That's 10 million. So, meron sana tayong excess of cost over carrying amount amounting to 2.5 million. Kaso lang, it is attributable to goodwill. So, kay goodwill man na siya, we will not amortize it. So, that's why wala na tayong entry dito na amortization sa end of the accounting period. Kasi nga, goodwill will not be amortized but tested only for impairment. Okay, at natapos din. So, thank you so much for uh, watching this video class and I hope you learned something. I just like to um, emphasize no, na although ang daming, uh, daming concepts na dinascuss dito, but uh, what is very important here is that you are able to focus your attention doon sa how do you account um, investment in associate under equity method. Although, Ang, ang complication no, sa ato ang accounting is magdepende rin sa kung ano yung problem na binigay. At least you'll have a little knowledge or basic knowledge as to uh, how do we account, for example, for this investment in associate under equity method. Uh, mga basic like um, yung pag-recognize ng share ng net income or share ng net loss Tsaka ano yung treatment ng cash dividends. No? And then, uh, add-on na lang yung mga other concepts no, na natutunan natin. Like for example, yung mga excess ng um, cash or in excess ng cost over your carrying amount or yung mga net, uh, excess ng net fair value for example. No? So, yun, Anna. so, I hope you really learned something from this video class and I still have one video left about uh, investment naman or financial assets at amortized cost. Thank you so much for your patience in watching this video and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!